If you're interested in the museum world, you're gonna be interested in any culture that exists around you, especially in a sense of place. The strength of Western art in this region and sort of this interesting dialogue that's happening for museums and across the country of really what does the West or Western art really mean or art of the American West or how do you, how do you define it? Like anything, we can't bottle things up in time. We always need to have this constant dialogue. And we, of course, want to honor the past, but we also have to be really present. So you're going to have to teach me. I've never been able to say your last name. I'm not sure I'll be able to say it today, but I'm going to try. If you want to give me a quick way to say how to say your name. <laughs> it's Mick O. Lazak. Mick O. Lazak. Oh, that's not that hard. Yeah. Uh, well, you throw the J, the JCZ is just, it throws everybody off. Mick O'Lazak, correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. Mick yep. O'Lazak. Yeah, yep. I've asked many people and I get a variety and I hear it sometimes. I go, oh, that's right, Mick O'Lazak. And then I try to yeah. say it, but yeah, that breaking it down to that <laughs> as much. <laughs> so we're starting our podcast as you, right now, uh, Jeremy. Awesome. And uh, I've known Jeremy for four years and I've just now learned to say his name, Mick O'Lazak. And literally, it's taken me four years to be able to pronounce it. I think I got it right now. Mikko Lazak? You did get it, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And hopefully, I'll, I'll just refer to my podcast in the future if I don't know how to say it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really, uh, it, and there's a lot of consonants and vowels. And when you see it written out, it just looks like blah, 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 jumbo, but it's Mikko Lazak. <laughs> now it's easy. It's not that hard. Now, now it's not that hard. You know, I always just tell people, it's like, you can call me Jeremy at any moment. And it's the easy, you know. Anytime yeah. you meet somebody, especially too, I mean, you think about it four and a half years ago coming into here, it's everybody kind of looked at my name like, what the hell? So <laughs> <laughs> how do you say that? And so, you know, it's always been Jeremy first and foremost. Did they call you the Mick or anything when you were a kid or Lazak or? Oh yeah, Miko is our is our nickname, so. Ah, okay, that helps So me. Miko is always the big one. But you know, it's funny because I've always, even throughout my entire career, it's always been People can't say my last name, but they also have a challenge with the first name. I've been called Jeffrey, Jamie, uh -huh. Josh, uh, Jason. It's always really fun to see people like actually go through the J names. And it's like, that uh -huh. seems to be the easier portion of the name is, as opposed to my last name. Uh -huh. but, you know. Yeah, you would think so. I mean, Jeremy's not that hard. <laughs> Michael Lazak is a little tougher, but <laughs> especially. Yeah. Now. So I remember one of, one of my, yeah. go ahead. I was gonna say, I'm just thrilled to have you on because we've been talking about doing this for a while. I've had a lot of museum directors on, actually. Yeah. Um, and I thought, well, TMA, which I love and is an important component of our lives and the community, you know, we should be promoting TMA and, and our wonderful director, i.e. you. So I'm, you know, I'm glad you finally got to take the time. And the museum is open, correct? Yes, we are open. Yeah, we've been open since July 30th. So, and, you know, to really good response. People are respectful, uh, they understand the conditions. And so we've been very fortunate um, at TMA to have, you know, such a good crowd come in. And we're seeing new members and we're seeing new people come in who haven't been to the museum. So they're really seeing it as a resource during these challenging times. And is that why you think that you're seeing the new people is because other things are closed and this is like, well, what's open, what can I do? I think that's part of it. I, you know, I think too, I mean, this summer you didn't have the travel as you normally would. I think we're all a little challenged by a, a sense of wanderlust that we normally enjoy during these sort of hot months in Arizona. Um, but you had the local community really stay put just given the restrictions. And so I think, you know, people were looking for things to do. Number one, that was inside and cool, but was also safe. So, you know, the museum was a very fortunate, you know, place, you know, we're in a fortunate time to have that as a resource. And, you know, outside of that, I mean, we we were actually, we had the opp opportunity to actually open a couple of weeks earlier, but, you know, given with the wing, uh, finalizing construction and installation, you know, we opened at the end of the month, which actually worked out great. Um, I know our colleagues up at the herd, you know, David opened in, you know, I think it was May into early June, uh, and they've been doing well in, in addition. So and I know Phoenix, our colleagues up in Phoenix just opened uh, this month. So, I think we're slowly starting to see that, you know, Arizona open up in a safe and responsible manner. And, you know, knock on wood, we've been, we've been very fortunate and very lucky. Yeah. Well, it, it, it comes from the top down, I can tell you. So. <laughs> it does. I mean, it really does. You set the tone for how it's going to work. And yeah. um, 
the though we'll get into it a little bit later just i would like to talk a little bit just because we're on this subject the castner mm -hmm. wing which i haven't seen tell us a little bit about that that's an amazing part of the museum that's you know uh, I, i've seen the images but yeah. i haven't to see it so tell us a little <laughs> bit about that that undertaking sure so the castle wing's been about three years in the making and it's a it's a new wing it's a roughly just under seven thousand square feet of 100 percent exhibition space uh, that was something really important to us as we were thinking about growth of the museum is what do we need most and obviously it's space to show art and um, you know it took a journey uh, it was 18 months construction um, like I said three years in the making uh, in early conversations with of course the Kasser family uh, in particularly of building this wing uh, it was really what do we focus the institution on they of course are avid collectors of uh, art of ancient Americas or pre-Columbian art, uh, as it's formally uh, referred to. And, um, you know, that was something that was really important to them, that they see a place for their legacy and their collection to go. Uh, they both have um, young children, but uh, they, the children are not necessarily interested in this particular area. They're both really quite invested in contemporary art. And so we kind of got into this conversation about this whole idea of what does, it, what does this expansion look like? Should the museum take on the collection? You know, how would we display it? Um, how would we actually utilize it? And so, you know, in those early conversations, we were really grateful to the family and to their curator, Joanne Storr, who were actively engaged in the conversations about the formation of the wing from the design, you know, to, you know, how we would sort of organize it. And, um, you know, it really kind of grew from there. They were, of course, the namesake donors and funders for this particular wing, and we kept the wing uh, within the budget that we had, which we were very fortunate to do, um, given the complexities of the time. Uh, and of course, we were on a little bit of delay due to COVID and some other sort of, you know, construction challenges that everybody's facing right now. Uh, but we're really, you know, we're so pleased to have it open. It's, it feels like it, you know, I, I still can't sort of fathom that it's open and available to the public. And every time I walk through, you know, I'm just so happy to see people in it. Uh, you know, you've been building this and dealing with the challenges that we all face you know, when you, you know, you construct something of this nature. And, um, you know, the other thing too is what I'll say is that what's really different about this particular wing as opposed to other projects at other museums across the country is this is representing 3,000 years of Latin American art. And we know the idea of what Latin American art is, you know, very broad and diverse. And we wanted to make sure that we have the ability to show that. And so this wing obviously highlights not only the Casser's personal collection, it also highlights the Baker's collection of Art of Ancient Americas. And in addition to that, we've included the museum's colonial collection and also a you know, pretty large portion of the wing dedicated to modern and contemporary Latin American art. Because we really want to make sure that people understand sort of the history of what is Latin American art, how diverse it is, and of course, looking at representation across the board, whether it's by region, by indigenous tribe, uh, by, you know, however it may seem. So we wanted to make sure we get a broad spectrum so that people just don't think it is sort of art of ancient Americas, you know, Latin American folk art, uh, but it really has this complex and diverse sort of genre. So it includes anything that would be uh, New America as well, like California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas even? Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. It, it runs the gamut. I mean, really, it's, it's the basis, the origin of Latin American, whether that's by where it was created, the artist, uh, the region, however it might be, that is really technically the only caveat. So, you know, if you look in our contemporary wing, of course, our contemporary gallery for that, we're looking at, you know, artists from, you know, Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, Mexico, uh, even into the United States, of course. Uh, we have artists who may be born, born in Puerto Rico, but they're based out of Miami. And of course, we have a, a great uh, young LA artist, Patrick Martinez, that we just acquired a fantastic new piece from. Uh, uh, and so it, it really is an extension. And then you look into the, you know, of course, the, the pre-Columbian or the ancient art of ancient Americas, you know, we're running down the coast, of course, to Peru, uh, you know, into, you know, um, you know, just along that coast there, basically the Andean coastline, and then going up through Colombia, and then up through Mexico and Central America, of course, we're, we're very, we have a very strong collection in sort of West Mexican uh, art of ancient Americas, a lot of, you know, representing a, a good cross section of the indigenous cultures that uh, existed at this time, our ancient cultures. 
And then also, of course, the Colonial Collection, which has really been a stronghold for the museum, you know, since its founding. It has a pretty extensive uh, colonial painting collection, uh, primarily, of course, from, the, from Peru and the Andean region as well. So, so it's a really interesting sort of take on, on really looking at Latin American art where, you know, in the space itself, um, I think for those folks who have not visited the museum, the museum is such a unique design in the way that it's constructed. Uh, because it's a, obviously it's a sort of a reverse Guggenheim that goes into the ground. And so you kind of can't see cross sections between galleries. So you're kind of isolated in particular galleries. Whereas this wing is really an open space. It's really an open concept uh, space that you can really make those references visually as you're looking at, you know, a piece by Carlos Bentoncourt, a contemporary artist. And in your, in your sight line, you're seeing, you know, a great piece from West Mexico that's, you know, hundreds and thousands of years old. So uh, it's pretty it's pretty special in that nature. And also too, it also makes it unique is the, you know, with this particular building, it is a very contemporary looking design. And that was done uh, intentionally, of course, to really, you know, let it blend with, of course, the original construction from 1975. Uh, but it's also too, it's really great to see these works in natural light. Whereas I think when you go to many major museums and you're looking at sort of their ancient collections, they're always sort of in these dark dungeon spaces. And True. you know, you really need light to see them and, and to see the quality of work and to really look at it from just an artistic perspective. It's really amazing. And I think it brings a whole new sort of look and understanding to a lot of these works. And so who would be kind of your, I don't want to use the word competitor, but I'm going to use it in the museum world that would have something like this. I mean, there's not, I mean, there's Governor's Palace in Santa Fe has a beautiful thing, but it's more focused on Spanish colonial of New Mexico. I think LACMA has something in LA, but is there yep. somebody that's done this kind of thing that's there? Yes and no. Um, I would say, you know, and it, it's, what's really great is also through this whole process, we were able to hire a new curator at the museum, Dr. Christopher Driggers, who, is about a year and a half in and has done extensive work on, on these collections. And he's just done an outstanding job. And, you know, he's one of 12 in this country that really specialize and focus in, you know, art of ancient Americas. And, you know, what's interesting about that is that his colleagues are those institutions. It's, it's LACMA, it's the Art Institute of Chicago, it's the Met, um, you know, these really large historic institutions and you know it's really hard to sort of compare us now to any of anyone else of our size. I guess you could look at San Antonio, possibly. I mean, they have a pretty extensive uh, folk art in ancient America's collection. Um, but this this sort of new wing and this sort of new venture for us really puts us in a unique position to really reposition sort of the whole idea of what is the West. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for us at the institution, we don't see necessarily the borders per se. You know, we're, for us, we're kind of a borderless institution because it's about culture, it's about art, it's about, you know, all of this other aspect than necessarily sort of just looking at a border, which is fairly a new construct in, in relationships to, you know, 3,000 years. So it, it's really sort of, again, a unique take for us. And, you know, we're looking at the, the future, you know, looking at, you know, not necessarily just sort of ancient Americas or sort of, you know, the, the big contemporary artists, but you know, the local artists who are here, the collections that are here, and how they all relate to sort of this, the telling of the story of what, what does it really mean to be in the Southwest, or sort of what, how does that relate to sort of Latin America. So, so it really is a sort of a new day for us in that sense. Did you put the Jimena sculpture in there? <laughs> no, unfortunately, unfortunately not in this round, but, it, but we were fortunate to put the Jimena sculpture, of course, it was included in Julie's last exhibition of, you know, telling the story of Elaine Horwich, but uh, it's back out in the window. So we're fortunate. It's one of the first things you see, of uh -huh. course, when you when you come into the museum. And do, is there so much, is the material so deep that you can't keep it all out at one time? So uh, there's a percent of it that's uh, in storage? Oh, sure. I mean, I think we're, you know, on average, we're putting out about 4% of our collection out now. Um, that's throughout the, the entire museum. And that's fairly good for an institution of our size. I mean, we have over 10,000 objects. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of objects to go through to try to get out on view. Uh, and our curators do an excellent job working with the collection. Uh, but even too, with this, with this particular installation, if you're just looking at Art of Ancient Americas, we're, you're dealing with over 500 objects total between the museum's collection, the Baker and the Kasser collections. 
So we have a little over 100 objects out now. And again, this is really sort of the best of the best. And Chris has done just a, an amazing job crafting a narrative to sort of introduce this type of work or this collection to the community. And I think that's really important. He does, you know, all the curators at TMA do an excellent job sort of contextualizing the collection and really trying to, you know, think about art in new and exciting ways that may not have necessarily been traditionally done before. Yeah, and TMA has uh, kind of a unique setting in the sense now you've added this uh, wing for the American uh, Hispanic, uh, contemporary, ancient, but you also have great Native American art. You have a Absolutely. very strong Western American art collection, and we have a, a fairly sizable and growing and a few really important pieces with contemporary art, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and I think that's been a big shift of the museum over the last, you know, since I've been on board for years, um, you know, building upon the great work that, you know, of course, Dr. Robert Knight did at the institution. And, you know, for us, it's really been about over the last couple of years, focusing and lasering in on really what is important to represent sort of the, the Southwest. Uh, what does it mean to be a regional institution? I think that's a big question that many of us, uh, you know, and our colleagues answer and, and sometimes necessarily, not necessarily fail, but there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, I think we've obviously seen a lot of big shifts up to the north in Phoenix, you know, kind of the rethinking of what does the Phoenix Art Museum and really what do they stand for? And, and I think, you know, again, I think Tim's gonna do a great job, the new director, in terms of carrying it into that, that sort of new uh, identity. But we're really focused on this region. We're really focused on making sure that we represent the best of these cultures, artists, peoples, however, you know, you sort of want to quantify it. And, you know, it's, it's, it's always like the story, you know, you think about it, if you're a New Yorker and you're coming to Tucson because, you know, you want to come out here for, let's say, the landscape, because you're enchanted by the desert landscape, and you're a museum goer, so you want to go down to the museum, you know, what, what's, what's the best thing that somebody wants to see? Of course, they want to see that region, you know, right. and, and, and all of the complexities of what it represents, not necessarily just, you know, the traditional sort of Western art, but what does contemporary Western art look like? How does that sort of interject in the conversation of indigenous art? And then of course, you know, looking at some of the local community as well. And then with this, with the Casser wing, you know, really the influence of, of Latin American art on this region. And, you know, there are some also big shifts, I would say we're, we're in the process of um, uh, reinstalling our indigenous arts collection. Uh, that's led by, of course, our, our great curator, uh, Christine Brinza, who's just done a phenomenal job at the institution. And this is going to be a new project for us. Uh, this is what we're sort of understanding, or just we're calling it in this way, but really the philosophy behind it is a community curated exhibition. Uh, and so we're really working uh, heavily with our indigenous populations here in Southern Arizona and to the north, of course and really making sure that they have a voice and a say in what goes out on view, how we're sort of interpreting those collections, and also too, making sure that we've got this cross representation of not just sort of indigenous cultures here, sort of on the side of the United States, but we're also looking to the South as well, making sure we have representation of those indigenous populations as well. And, you know, also too, investing heavily into a lot of what's happening, you know, in the current contemporary scene, of course, for indigenous artists, because we're seeing you know, a huge resurgence and also a real emphasis on indigenous artists in the United States, which is fantastic. It's, it's, a, it's wonderful to see all these institutions finally start to focus and really you know, support the work that's been done by our indigenous communities. Um, but also too, you know, for us looking at the past and really what has sort of crafted and gotten us to this particular point. So uh, we were fortunate to get a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services to do this work. And it's a, it's a three-year project, so it's, it's quite extensive. So through the, throughout the museum, you're going to be doing that, and mainly spearheaded by Christine? So this is spearheaded through Christine. Uh, it's going to really focus on the indigenous reinstall. Uh, we, are also, we are also going to be focusing on our folk art collection. We just received a major folk art collection uh, from, uh, from a couple funders who you know, really focused heavily on Peru. Uh, it's an area that we don't have high representation or large amounts of representation. So um, both the indigenous and folk art are going to sort of be under these guidelines of this community-based curation. And uh, it's really exciting to watch. Um, both Christine and Dr. Mariana Pegno, our curator of community engagement, are just, you know, 
it's, it's just astounding in terms of the amount of work that's going into it, the conversations we're having. It, you know, we're all learning through this process. Um, and so I think this is just what's going to come out. The product is just really going to be phenomenal. Yeah, that sounds exciting. Yeah, you'll have your work cut out for you. And you get to do it during the pandemic. You know, that's even more interesting. <laughs> you know, just throw a few things on the, on, the, on the plate, right? Yeah, yeah, that makes it easier. Well, I want to get to the beginning of where you came from. I did a little bit of research just to see kind of your history, um, which is, uh, you know, I see this why, uh, West, uh, West Virginia connection. Mm -hmm. too, so I want to find out where did you grow up? <laughs> I grew up in Michigan. I grew up um, in Bay City, Michigan, which is about 90 miles north of Detroit. It's one of the Tri-Cities, about 30 minutes north of Flint. Um, and it's, you know, it's a relatively, you know, uh, mid-sized community, uh, but uh, it was a really unique experience at a great, great growing up. And, um, you know, what? it's not a very, um, even though I've had exposure to art, it was not necessarily a area that's heavy in particularly sort of the traditional arts. I spent a lot of time at the Detroit Institute of Art. That was sort of my, um, you know, hallowed ground that I would go and visit. And um, just to see, I mean, you know, and that's really, I know, I know I speak with sometimes about it, but, you know, really for me getting into this world, getting into the idea of understanding and wanting to explore museums really started there with, of course, seeing, you know, the spirit of Detroit, the Diego Rivera mural, um, and really just, you know, being wowed by this, by this sort of masterpiece. And so uh, it was, you know, it was a really sort of interesting sort of journey. Um, my history doesn't sort of uh, sort of match a lot of other sort of historic directors uh, who, you know, have gone through a lot of art historical backgrounds and, you know, come from families that have had, you know, a lot of experience in terms of air exposure, I should say. Um, so it's a little bit different, but uh, it's, it's been fun. It's been a great learning process throughout my entire life. What'd your mom and dad do? <laughs> my dad's a my dad's a corporate accountant, and uh, my mother was you know she was a home mom. She was a jack of all trades and has done and continues to do, you know the she's the amazing glue to the family. Uh -huh. So you know we're all grateful for for our mothers, of course, and their abilities to support us and do throughout you, our entire lives. <laughs> you have brothers and sisters. Yes, I have two sisters. I am the, I am the middle child of two sisters. Ah, so yeah, there, you there go. was none of that sort of, you know, uh, middle child syndrome in, in, in our household. Uh -huh. so. And so, and what do your sisters do? Uh, both my sisters, uh, you know, live and work in Chicago. Um, you know, they're both, my, I'd say my older sister is very creative in that sense. Uh, she's sort of been in and out of the fashion world um, for, for times and working for department stores and things like that. And, uh, uh, my younger sister actually was early on interested in criminal justice, a very different, very different take. So we all kind of had a different, different sort of journey. And honestly, for me, uh, I left home at 18. So I was really, you know, I, I, I went on to West Virginia, as you mentioned, university. I was there on a swimming scholarship. Uh, and I actually had a very early different life. I mean, I was, you know, training for the Olympics, you know, you know pretty much an athlete. I mean, I, I lived the athlete's life. Um, you know, up at five, practice, back to practice at three after, you know, after school. And then, of course, you know, hitting the books in bed. I mean, it was a very regimented life, but, you know, very different. So, and that was, in, uh, but it was, it was a great experience. So in high school, you were a competitive swimmer and clearly good enough to get a uh, scholarship to go to a, a big school. Yeah, yeah, I, I worked hard. Um, I would swing since age nine. So it was um, something that, you know, I always feel like a little bit, especially out here, a little bit of a fish out of water. Um, and uh, it's, it's always been part of me. And it was, it was really great. I mean, I think it instilled in me, you know, some discipline, some work ethic, of course, you know, because you're training constantly. And swimming's not one of those sports to where, you know, you know, you can kind of pick it up. You, you know, you can't just swim a day here and there. I mean, it's something that you have to constantly yeah. work at. And, uh, you know, training is rigorous and it's a lot of hours. And uh, yeah, it carried me into West Virginia University, which I was really fortunate. Um, had great, great colleagues and swimmers there as well. And, um, you know, really enjoyed swimming collegiately for four years. And same thing. I mean, I think it's, it's a very different collegiate experience than necessarily somebody who's not going into sort of division one sports. Uh, your, your life is very controlled. Yeah, and then, all aspects yeah. of the year. <laughs> and and West Virginia is Division One, isn't it? That's Division yes. One sports, right? That's really big. Yep. And when you yep. were in high school, did you think 
that, okay, that was your focus. Uh, clearly it was part of it, but was that your focus and thinking, I'm going to be in the Olympics. That's really what I want to do. I want to get, win a gold medal. I think everybody goes into that. I mean, that's why you do it, right? I mean, it's, you know, you're a kid, you're watching these heroes and, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's something that we're always, you're always striving for. That is, that is the pinnacle in, swim, in the swimming world anyways, uh, is to get that Olympic gold medal. I mean, it's funny because you think world records are great, you know, but it's really about the Olympic gold medal. I mean, you could be a world record holder for years, but it doesn't mean anything if you don't have that gold medal. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was definitely something that we all thought about and strive for. I mean, that was, that was what you did it. I mean, that's why, I mean, it was really, and it's hard. I mean, it's a definitely a hard sport. It's a hard, it's a hard life. Um, it's very involved, as I mentioned. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate to go to, you know, the junior Olympics or uh, in a couple other sort of big meets that, you know, you're swimming against those folks who had, you know, the gold medals. And I always laugh because I actually swam against Michael Phelps and I did beat him. Of course, I was, you know, I think I was the age of 18 and he might have been 11. <laughs> um, so, I mean, he was, he was quite, he was quite fast as a young athlete and uh, he swam, he swam for uh, Club Wolverine at the University of Michigan. So uh, we would see them quite a bit training. And you act, and it really was, he was 11, you were 18 when he was competing against him. Mm -hmm. Oh my, he was yeah. really good, wasn't he? Yeah, Which, yeah. <laughs> he, he obviously did not fit in, in his age group, so he yeah. always sort of aged up. <laughs> you see somebody like that and you just go, oh man, there's just no way. I'm going to, I mean, he's so good. There's no way I can compete. Yeah, they're, they're just super, they're, I mean, they're people who are superhuman. And I think that's what's really amazing about life in general. I mean, you see these people and you're just sort of in awe, whether they're, you know, an athlete, you know, a writer, uh, an artist, uh, you know, even to, a, you know, a community leader, you're just sort of in awe of these people and the work that they do. And you just think, gosh, you know, how do they fit it all in? And it's, it's, it's really, it's challenging, but it's wonderful at the same time. And so when you were in high school, did you think about art at all? Were you making art or doing that kind of thing and thought possibly this might be a route for you? Oh, yeah. I mean, I was always been an art. I've always been sort of um, interested in the arts. Uh, you know, I, I drew at a very young age. I was always fascinated by drawing. And I actually started out as an art major. I mean, I have a, you know, my degree from West Virginia is in actual visual arts. I was a, I was a painting and printmaking major. And, uh, you know, that also shapes sort of an interesting, you know, kind of course for me as a curator, because obviously for me, it's a little bit different because I understand the artistic process. I, you know, I kind of know that mindset of what people are looking for and what, what artists go through those struggles. Um, but yeah, that was always the intention in the beginning is that, you know, I thought life was going to, you know, kind of work itself out as, you know, an artist and a professor teaching art. Um, but I think also too, because of my, my brain structure, I have both a right and left brain. It really kind of worked out that the museum world was really a better fit for me. And as I even went into graduate school uh, at the University of Florida, you know, I was still creating art at that time, but it really became more about, you know, writing and theory and art history that inspired me more and also, you know, the curatorial, you know, process, which was more exciting to me. And so it was a really easy shift at that point because the type of work that I was making just to say, you know, kind of make that transition from, you know, the idea of being just a visual artist full time to really looking into, you know, the museum world. And I'm one of many, I mean, it's not uncommon I mean, you think of somebody like Michael Govan at LACMA. I mean, he was a painter. Jerry Saltz, the writer, was a painter. Uh, it was a really easy, you know, I think a lot, of, a lot of artists have made that transition as well. Was there an aha moment, like, you know, in West Virginia when you're finishing up your degree that you go, I don't know if I can make it as a painter or as an <laughs> artist. And, you know, there's got to be something else I need to do. And your dad's a corporate accountant, so he's in the background yeah. going, uh, you need a real job, son. <laughs> right? I can hear it, right? He did yeah, do that. No, right? totally. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. I think, I think any parent comes into this, like, frightened by the fact that any child would say, oh, I want to be an artist. I, you know, I, I don't think that's necessarily a comfort level. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think there's been a couple moments throughout my sort of career where, you know, they were sort of aha moments. You know, they, and they were always, they all sort of happened in museums, right? They were always around really fascinating exhibitions. Um, whatever that might be, it might be a specific work of art. And I don't know if there was necessarily one sort of pivotal moment that made me sort of transition, but I think it was a series of events. And 
And like I said, my mind was always sort of, you know, traveling back and forth between these sort of, you know, two different sides of the brain and really what I was interested in. And I hate, I mean, I don't mean this in sort of any sort of crass way, but I just feel like there's so many artists out there. And if I didn't necessarily have an original voice, then I really didn't think it was going to be, you know, I didn't want to do a disservice to the, to the profession for me to sort of just be in, you know, half full. And so I really thought, you know, that was probably a really good pivotal point to say, okay, there's, there's some, some way that I can continue sort of my creative interests and still do these other aspects. And I love working with artists. I love working with collectors. I love working with anyone in the creative field, um, the staff itself. I mean, it really, it really is a creative industry. It's a creative process, but it's also a business as well. So it really hones in on those two sides of my interest. Mm. And so when you finished your BFA in West Virginia, then you went to, where did you go from there? Florida? So after my BFA, I actually went to um, the University of Georgia. I did a study abroad program that was uh, with UGA, and that was great. Um, spent, spent a good, good summer, and a, summer and some bit in Italy, which was really, you know, again, transformational, of course, in, in any artist's career or anyone interested in the arts. Uh, and then actually came back and was a community curator for a while at a community art center in Michigan. Uh, and it was really, again, it was sort of my first professional job in the curatorial process. Of course, I was doing a lot more than that, as we all do in the arts. We wear many hats. Um, but it was really a great experience and really shaped a lot of the way that I think about curation and audiences when I do curate exhibitions, but also working with the local community. Uh, one nice thing about growing up in sort of mid-Michigan is you have, you do have some universities there that are doing some great work. And so you had a great roster of faculty and artists to work with. So there was a rich and broad artist community there. And then really from there, uh, I was there for a couple of years and then went on to the University of Florida where I was a graduate fellow and worked both, of course, in, you know, on my degree in visual art and also contemporary theory and art history. Yeah, so after you did the community gig for a couple of years, you kind of had solidified, I know what I want to do and what I want to be. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I think it, 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 you know, at that time too, I was still, still making work. I was still producing work. And I think again, as I transitioned into the University of Florida with, I had some great faculty and some great mentors, many of whom I still speak with today. Um, it, again, it was just very, very, um, you know, part of my work, uh, even there. Oh, oh, okay, so they're good. Yep, I'm still there. Okay, good. I, can see. I thought you were <laughs> trying, trying to cut down email here. Uh, um, I'm getting a phone call right there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no, it's, it's horrible. Um, but yeah, I think it was really part of um, that process already started. And it took a couple key faculty, I would say, Alex Albero, who is um, up at Barnard College in New York City, who of course is one of the you know pivotal historians on photography. Uh, and Arnold Meshes, who was, a, who was a wonderful social realist painter and a few other instrumental faculty who really, you know, we had a lot of philosophical conversations about what does the future look like for myself? What am I interested in? And also too, I did have some experience uh, curating at that time as well through the university structure. So it was sort of a natural progression. And, you know, the great thing at that time at the University of Florida was they were open to it. It was not necessarily so traditional or structured in its program. So if students came in, especially graduate students came in and found that they were more engaged in other areas, they allowed that process to happen and sort of recrafted that curriculum to make it fit for what they were interested in. So I was really fortunate to have some great people there to work with. Why did you end up in Florida? What was that that said, oh, I'm going to Florida? The weather? Well, yeah, sure. Part of it, I you know, you're coming, from Mich you're coming from Michigan, right? Yeah, no, I did the right um, <laughs> the Medical school was like, I'm going to Florida in the winter. That's, like, that's where I'm going. Uh, really, it was, it was really about, um, you know, as I mentioned, I was a graduate fellow there. So I received a fellowship to, to go to graduate school. I had a couple other options uh, that uh, didn't necessarily have the support that I would at UF. And um, Looking at the faculty, I mean, outside of, you know, Alex and Arnold, you know, um, Max Bescher uh, was there as well. Uh, of course, he's the son of Hildenburn Bescher, the great German photographers. Uh, Ron Janowitz was there. There's this great convergence of faculty there who were re doing really interesting work. And um, I think that was a big, a big point for me is who was I going to be working with, uh, what types of conversations I was having. You know, but at the end of the day, I mean, you're looking at it, you're going to art school. They're offering you, you know, free tuition, a right. stipend, 
you know, you might as well take it. <laughs> yeah. Your dad's like, yeah, that's your spot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right? I can see it. <laughs> Uh -huh. so just you, a little part of it uh -huh. i'm sure you had that discussion or he had it with you sure. Sure. <laughs> I, as any smart parent would right yeah, that's true. absolutely <laughs> especially one who's an accountant and so you finish up there and get your master's and then what do you do so then i went on to chicago where i was actually the assistant director of a commercial gallery um this was right around 2006 2007 uh, of course, and uh, you know, you're in the height of everything at that point. And I, so I was the assistant director and primarily, you know, working with the owner directly uh, as of course, you know, uh, you work one-on-one -on -one with, with many of your employees because it's a very small enterprise and uh, you know, was directing a gallery that was dedicated to uh, Danish design, primarily cabinet maker pieces from the 1920s through the 1940s in addition to dealing uh, contemporary Danish ceramics and other sort of um, artists as well. So it was a really great experience um, getting in, you know, really getting in and understanding the gallery world specifically at that time in Chicago. There were a lot of shifts happening. You know, I was organizing fair, you know, our booth at fairs, you know, presenting, you know, the gallery at, you know, major fairs, the Armory Show, um, the San Francisco Modernism Show, as well as of course, you know, at that point it was um, Art at the Mart uh, which is, you know, a later version of the Navy Pier show. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, really got an understanding of the gallery world then and, um, you know, what it means to be in that sort of, in your position, really. And um, it was also a good learning experience for me because I realized I was not necessarily interested in sales. Mm -hmm. Even though I love to sell the museum and everything else, it was really tough for me because I was always interested in the object and how people were interested in it, why they came in, um, so it was a, also a, sort of a really good learning experience. And I had a great mentor. Uh, Andrew Hollingsworth uh, was the owner of the gallery. And, uh, you know, he came from a non-traditional background per se. He was, an, uh, you know, a hedge fund uh, individual, uh, previous profession with UBS, uh, and uh, was very successful and then went on to this career and has since gone on to other careers. But it was, it was a really great experience. And he was in the process of writing a book called Danish Modern. And so it was great to sort of work on that book with him, do some research and really, you know, run the gallery from, from top to bottom. So, and really get to know in, the ins and outs. But and did, I always found myself talking with the, with, the, with the people coming in about art and everything else, less about sort of the pushy aspect of, you know, getting them to really, you know, buy what we had or really invest in, in the actual gallery. Yeah, no, I, I had one of my uh, directors was an ex-museum director and he uh, was similar. Uh, <laughs> I love him, and uh, and he would laugh right along with you, saying, "Yep, that maybe not sales might not have been my strong point." You know, for what we do, I, I'm not I'm not a sales kind of guy, even though I'm in sales. Yeah. It's more, you know, I like that component of teach, learn, show the art, <laughs> show you know your enthusiasm. To me, is the most important thing, and then the kind of yep. the sales follow. Though most galleries, I think, are more like you know, get them in there and sell it up, buddy. But, um, yeah. <laughs> and so how did you end up in that position? You know, what made you go to a commercial gallery versus go right to a museum? Was it just, that's what was available and you needed to make money or was there a deeper thing that thought maybe I might be a gallerist? Maybe that's a, a way for me too. Mm -hmm. Well, I think first, first it was, you know, you're, you know, you're finishing your MFA, you're riding this high of this degree, this right. experience, you know, the, the community that MFAs really produce. I think anybody who goes through that type of program knows whoever was in your class are sort of lifelong friends and their colleagues that you, you know, see from, you know, throughout, you know, I still see many colleagues whether, wherever I go. And, you know, I think I was looking at a lot of people, of course, were vacating to New York at that point or even going down to Miami. Um, given the close proximity to Gainesville. And, uh, you know, I had family in Chicago. It was sort of an easy transition. And I thought, you know, I was not necessarily at that point interested in jumping and heading to New York City. Um, but so I thought, I'll, I'll try Chicago. And that was really how I got there. And once I got there, it was really trying to understand the lay of the land. I think as anybody knows, it's hard to break in those worlds. It's not necessarily easy if you're not in those environments. So it was tough in the beginning to get into any sort of program or get a, a position at the Art Institute or the MCA or any one of the other big institutions there. 
because I wasn't coming from that, that world. I wasn't coming from UIC or SAIC or the University of Chicago. So I didn't necessarily have the contacts. And I was fortunate, you know, in this way, you know, Andrew was supportive in, in opening that door. And, you know, that was just, again, something I was interested in regardless is working in the gallery world and trying to understand that. Still trying to figure out what was my place uh, at that point and, you know, where I find myself most interested. And, uh, you know, again, it was, it was great, of course, up until about, you know, 2008 when, when the rug fell out. And so, is that what happened in 2000? You were working for him up into 2008 and then the Great Recession hit? Pretty much. I mean, we looked at the recession. Um, we did a certain things. We downsized the gallery, of course, moved a lot into, you know, um, storage that could be shown to clients and things like that. You know, it became more of an advisory and sort of boutique service. And, uh, you know, at that point, too, again, I realized this was not really the environment that I wanted to continue in. I had the opportunity to continue with the gallery, but I decided to look elsewhere. And that's what really led me to Kansas City and to the University of Central Missouri. Was, you know, and that was the progression is, okay, let's go into sort of the academic world of gallery management. Uh, and they provided the opportunity to really make that transition. So for me, even though 2008 happened and everything else sort of fell out, I was really fortunate to sort of make that transition right about that time and um, really come to get to know Kansas City. I love Kansas City. The, the community, you know, holds a, a dear place in my heart. It's an amazing artistic community. Uh, they have some great institutions. And uh, it, was, it was really interesting to get, you know, kind of back into academia. And so that was a, that was a unique experience as well, kind of leading up to where I am uh, and really understanding working with a department, faculty, you know, on exhibition development, um, you know, the purpose of the galleries, particularly in this, in this university. And much like, you know, the, the interesting part about that university is, you know, Kansas City has UMKC and Rockhurst, which are a few major foundational institutions in the city. But if you look at the sort of the metropolitan area, uh, University of Central Missouri and the University of Kansas are sort of the anchors that are part of the metropolitan area. So, of course, KU on the, on the Kansas side and UCMO on the Missouri side. So I was able and fortunate to live in Kansas City and really be part of this sort of urban environment with a lot of great artists and great museums. Yeah, it, it, it does have some great art. It really does. And mm -hmm. so when you, what cho made you go from there? Because then you went to Miami, right? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think like anybody, you know, young progression, um, you know, hungry for something a little deeper, uh, you know, more, more, you know, sort of exposure, larger community. It was tough to leave Kansas City. It's a great, it's a great city. And it's also one of those areas where at the time, I mean, you had these historic directors in place, many of whom are still there. You know, Bruce Hartman's one of the great ones that comes to yeah. mind and a great collector of indigenous art, yeah, his yeah. personal collection anyways. Um, you know, then these great, these great mentors to work with, Rachel Smith over at um, H&R Block, which is part of KCAI. And you had this history there. And so, you know, I think looking at opportunities in the city, it was a little slim and I was ready to make that next move after about four years of being, you know, with the university. And so uh, this, this position with Miami came up and uh, I just jumped on it and, uh, you know, kind of never looked back. It was, and it was a great transition. Uh, again, that sort of other unique experience. Um, it was, I mean, Miami shaped a lot of who I am today. Um, in both of what the opportunities I was able to do, but also the experience that I gained and uh, really the abilities of what they allowed me to do at that institution. So it was, it was really transformational. Yeah, that's a big job too. I mean, you had a whole group of museums that you had to, to deal with, right? That was no small undertaking. Yeah, and, and, you know, the biggest thing that they, that the director who brought me in, or the, the vice president, I should say, who brought me in, uh, you know, we were very clear in our early conversations of what were the goals and objectives for her and for the institution. And they've been sort of challenged by um, just previous, just the administration, the previous administration having challenges getting the museum off the ground. So that was one of the big, the big, you know, projects right, right from the get go was to sort of reorganize. Um, because it was also, it was the Museum and the Freedom Tower, um, which is now the Museum of Art and Design. Uh, it also included each campus gallery, which there were eight campus galleries, a, sc a large international sculpture park, and two other historic properties, sort of, uh, which was in sort of my 
um, you know, stewardship and, and leadership. And uh, it was a really small staff, um, but a great staff, a mighty staff. And, uh, you know, we, we, we did some great work. Uh, the, we got the museum off the ground. We got it organized. We got, you know, the, the calendar of exhibitions going, three-year outlooks. You know, in Miami is a tough market for museums, right? You're, you're in one of the, the greatest cities for art. It has a, you know, it, I think there's 12 large art institutions in, you know, kind of in South Florida. So your, your competition is great, if you want to call it that. And um, also, too, we were really fortunate to find sort of our voice uh, as an institution amongst that field in somewhere where we didn't quite have necessarily have the resources that the large institutions did. I mean, we were still an academic institution. We still had that ability to connect to the faculty and to the students, uh, but also really bring this international program uh, to the college. And I was also fortunate too, to work with some great colleagues uh, there. Uh, the museum and gallery structure was one of five cultural entities as part of underneath the president. So it was a direct line to the president of the college. Uh, who was a great advocate for the arts. So I had some great colleagues and collaborations with the film festival, the live art series, the book fair, which is one of the most phenomenal book fairs in the country, uh, and also um, Spanish language theater, which was also really great to have, of course, in a Spanish speaking city. And of course, you know, I was, I was a minority there, which was a really exciting and uh, informative experience. I mean, I don't think many, many people have that opportunity. So yeah, you know, I had, no, to, learn, I had to learn Spanish or Spanish lingua very quickly. Having grown up in New Mexico, I can tell you it's a good thing to be a minority. Uh, it, gives <laughs> you a, it does. It gives you a sense of what it means to uh, be a minority and to yeah. deal with culture and to get along in different situations. And yeah, no, it's really helpful. I think. I think everybody should grow in that kind of situation, and uh, they, we'd be a lot yeah. country. That's for sure. I think so too. I think you know it's it's interesting too because you know with with Miami, you have, it's not really necessarily a melting pot, as you sort of say the rest of the country is. Um, you know, I think they, they, they call it, you know, kind of a salad where it's sort of everybody's their own individual in, ingredient and they bring it together to kind of create the salad, um, which is sort of a bad analogy, but it, but it sort of works. Um, in addition to that though, um, you know, you're dealing with these cultures, you know, of course, you know, the Cuban cultures obviously being a, you know, that, Point, leading a Cuban landmark for the exile community and for the you know the new generation of, of young Cubans coming over to the United States. Um, also, too, you're dealing, of course, with a really extensive Haitian population, um, both sort of new sort of new immigrants and sort of kind of the established immigrant you know immigrants in the city, and then of course you know Venezuelan Colombians. You know you're dealing with international um, delegations because of course most European nations and Latin American nations have consulates in that area vying for your attention to uh, get to know their artists. Uh, so I had some great relationships with the German consulate, the Argentinian consulate, uh, the Canadian consulate, uh, and of course the Spanish consulate uh, who has just done great work in Miami as well. So it was a really diverse and international, you know, sort of base position. And in that area, it's mainly contemporary art, really. I guess Latin and contemporary, right? Yeah, primarily contemporary. You know, I think the influence of Art Basel, of course, the big art fair has had a huge influence on that on that city. And, um, you know, where they've grown from that is just, is just tremendous. And to see this emphasis in this mecca for contemporary art is really wonderful. And you've got a lot of great collectors there and supporters there who believe in that as well. So, uh, yeah, I think there are some, there are some sort of the, um, uh, historic collections that are really great, uh, specifically at say the Low Art Museum at the University of Miami, which has a phenomenal glass collection. Uh, they have a whole pavilion dedicated to glass and uh, you have some other sort of historic collections in the city, but really it's contemporary art that drives the larger narrative. So you're in this wonderful cosmopolitan city, which is tropical, contemporary mm -hmm. art. And at some point you go, oh no, I think I'll go to the West where there's mainly <laughs> Western art Saguaro's dry. Uh, I mean, it's really, <laughs> right? It's, it seems yeah. antithetical that you would pick Tucson, but why did you? How did Tucson happen? Well, I think, it, it, you know, at that point, you know, I, I reached about five years at the institution. And, um, you know, again, I, I saw myself as much as I, you know, was doing a lot of great work in terms of being able to do great work in curatorial practices and things like that. I found myself again, it kind of being a little overextended into some administration as you know, most good university administrators do, right? They, they, they 
grab onto the people that are effective, they can get things done. And, um, you know, I, I saw myself kind of, you know, moving away from really what I was passionate about and what I loved about museums. And uh, I will never, you know, forget that experience. And I'm grateful for Miami-Dade College and of course the leadership of Eduardo Padron, the president. But, you know, at that point I really wanted to transition into an institution that was not connected to an academic institution. Uh, I, I, could, I saw what my colleagues were doing in Miami who were municipal, uh, you know, course, museums and really the connections that they could make with the community. And, um, you know, Tucson really offered that, that possibility. Uh, it was one of a couple institutions that I was in, you know, sort of in negotiations with at the time. And I just thought, you know, it's kind of either now or never. Um, either I'm gonna transition into a larger project, you know, at, at, at Miami-Dade College, or I'm gonna make this sort of larger life transition and really get into you know, really leading a civic institution that is really focused on the community. And I love the idea that this is the anchor institution in this city, sort of in this region, with some other wonderful, you know, colleagues and in other institutions in the city, you know, with UAMA, MOCA, in the desert, um, the desert museum. But also too, was really the opportunity and the people. I mean, I think we, we met really early on. I, I think you were, you were either part of the search process or we had early conversations on. And so it was really in those conversations that really Tucson became that opportunity that I was really interested in. And, uh, you know, I, I think again, just kind of went and didn't look back. Um, you know, it's a new adventure. It's, there's a wonderful staff. There's great people. We have such amazing donors and, and the public is, you know, at large. And um, the culture here was really important as well. Um, you know, the, the influence of, of Latin American and indig indigenous cultures, uh, really what this institution could stand for. And um, also too, a, a unique experience where I've never lived in the West. You know, I've, like, like many folks on the Eastern seaboard in the Midwest, I've driven, driven through from time to time if I was heading to the West Coast or doing sort of, you know, car journeys. But I never really did get, I never experienced that. And I've never been afraid as a person to really get to know a community or, or really, you know, want to make a change to where, you know, every community that I've ever lived in has been, I've, I've learned so much and I've been really fortunate to meet amazing people. And everywhere you go, it's really the people that make it. It's not necessarily all the other things, as you know, sort of fade away in time. And, you know, even too with the learning curve of really understanding the traditions of Western art, particularly in this area, that was, you know, we're always looking for constant growth and that was a really great, great experience as well. And it, and it continues to be a great experience. Yeah, when we were interviewing you, yeah, I mean, that was one of the questions. Well, will, will he, you know, does he get Western art? Will he like it? You know, he's more contemporary. I thought, you know, if you're in the region, you're gonna like it, you're gonna learn it, you're gonna be a part of it. And you seemed quite open to it. And the thing that really spoke to me and I actually, uh, uh, pushed hard for you actually uh, to get the position on what I, where, whatever I could do but you know you understood the internet you were young you understood social media I could see that that was you know to me without that you know where are you going to go and you know and now in a pandemic it really helps to have that young thinking internet social media reach out you guys are doing the things you know Christine's doing her stuff so you know, I, I, to me, it seemed like the natural fit. I was pleased that you said yes. And, you know, I, I figured you would either stay for a very, very short period of time or you hopefully <laughs> will maybe stay for a very long time. You know. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in, 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 thank you. For, thank you, obviously, for your support. It's great. I'm here. <laughs> I know. But um, and we actually, we just hit our milestone. We just hit 14,000 followers on Instagram. So it was a great milestone coming from, I think, we had about 500 followers, Nothing. maybe just about a thousand, yeah. and today we're hitting 14. So we're we're really we've done a lot of great work, and the team is just it's just great. But yeah, I think you know I, you're absolutely right. I think if you're if you're interested in the museum world, you're going to be interested in any culture that exists around you, especially in a sense of place. And that the, you know, kind of going back to that conversation of why would a New Yorker come out here? They're not coming out here necessarily to see, you know, in not to discredit anything, but sort of a second or third rate European master, right? They're coming out here to wanting to feel the culture, wanting to understand, wanting to feel somewhere else than where they normally are, as most of us look to museums to do. 
and you know the, the the strength of Western art in this region, and sort of this interesting dialogue that's happening for museums and across the country of really what does the West or Western art really mean, or art of the American West, or how do you how do you define it, uh, was a really great conversation and really sort of keen my interest in terms of understanding the complexities that exist, both from both from the traditional front, but also the contemporary side of it. But also too, what, what is TMA's role in the future? And I think that's one thing that I can test specifically through the work that you know, you've supported Christine in the past and the work the gallery is doing, you know, is really what is the future of Western art and what does it really mean and how do we engage with it? Because like anything, we can't bottle things up in time. We always need to have this constant dialogue. And we, of course, want to honor the past, but we also have to be really present. And uh, I thought that was that is something that TMA could definitely become a leader in and really be, you know, that that thought provoking museum when somebody thinks of, you know, Western art or art of the American West, or in this case, in the future of where we're going just in the immediate, you know, indigenous arts. So I think those are just really interesting questions and, and leadership needed to happen. I think that's something where you know, you're, you're seeing a lot of the transitions, of course, a lot of the institutions out West, you're seeing them may not necessarily focus as much attention on those traditions. And we wanna make sure that we have that balance because we are in that place and we, we are part of that culture. So I wanna make sure that that is, that is kept, you know, running throughout. Yeah, I think it's a deep thread into Tucson. I really do. I mean, it is, uh, and, and as time goes on, I think that thread will be a lot of our city founders and the museum will really hold on to that because it is so much of what we are and what we were and who we will mm -hmm. be in the future. Yeah. And um, it's easy to just go, oh, let's go and move on and do something else. But if you can at least keep your roots or at least understand where your roots come from, I think yeah. it helps you to be able to grow. And where do you see that? Where do you see Western art specifically uh, in the future? How does that, you see that evolving and changing and growing? Yeah, and that's a really good question. I think a lot of it's being answered right now or it's in process of being kind of thought about. Um, one of the exercises we're going through right now as an institution is we're redefining our collections plan. Uh, and so we've got a task force that includes some, you know, some great members of our collections committee. Uh, but also for the first time, we've been fortunate to bring on some indigenous um, artists and uh, leaders. And so that will also sort of help shape, you know, sort of the future of where the museum goes in that collection process. And actually, we have one of your one of your artists is on the uh, is on the committee as well. So we're very fortunate, and we're going to be doing some community sessions because I think that's again the challenges that you're seeing across the country, um, of course, with institutions as they sort of have moved away from their communities. They've moved away from the people that they serve, and so we want to make sure that we're bringing that and we're having that process. So we're having going to be having a lot of community dialogues of where does the institution go in terms of collecting. We know our core collecting areas. We're going to be less encyclopedic and more about this sort of region to be a really strong regional leader. And of course, Western art or art of the American West is part of that conversation. And what does that really look like? And again, through the work of the curators, I think they've done an excellent job, both Julie and Christine, in terms of defining what is Western art or what is art of this region. Um, but also, too, what are those larger dialogues and making sure that Indigenous and Latin American voices are part of those. And that's really the emphasis, too, with this wing, is that how do we look at some of our sort of more traditional Western art and really pair that with Latin, you know, you know Latin, artists of Latin descent or Latin American art or so, you know, specifically like in New Mexico, where, of course, you know, it is, it is Latin American art in that sense. And so how do you, you know, reform that dialogue and interject those other sort of points of view? And it's not necessarily about erasing history by any means. It's about creating this sort of new dialogue where we're honoring and representing everyone across the board and there's equity. And that, you know, everybody sort of has a seat at the table. And of course, yes, we want, and, you know, in a community that's 40% um, Latino, we want to make sure that when people come into this museum, they can identify and they can see themselves reflected. And also, too, I know we had one of the great, you know, early conversations when we were doing an exhibition, you know, that you were heavily involved in with 30 Americans, um, you know, it was really about, you know, highlighting, you know, artists of African descent or African American artists. Of course, we wanted to engage those artists that are in this community as well. And of course, one of the great Western artists or artists that identifies as a Western artist 
you know, Bob Van was included in sort of our uh, installation and really working with that to make sure, again, we're not just identifying or sort of being myopic in our view of really who are Western artists, right? Because they may not see themselves reflected in sort of the tradition. So as we look to the future, looking at sort of, you know, who are those artists, you know, of color who are, you know, dealing with art of the West and really, you know, kind of crafting a new narrative. Yeah, I, I think you're right on the right track. Uh, I think the institutions that will succeed and flourish, I think, will embrace this um, kind mm, of attitude. Absolutely. Yeah, especially uh, more s regional museums like ourselves. We may not always be a small regional museum. This, you know, this city's going to grow. I mean, we're a million now, and at some, point, we're, at some point, we'll probably be 10 million. And yeah. uh, it's hard to imagine, but it's going to happen at some point. Uh, I guess if we have water, right? I mean, that's yeah. going to be the big key. If yeah, we can yeah. get water. <laughs> yeah, Utah was good because he got us cap water, so we'll be okay. <laughs> Maybe uh, Nevada <laughs> and California may not be. Uh, so yeah. what do you see as your biggest challenges now, especially in this environment? I mean, I read that maybe up to one third of all museums will close because of the pandemic, yeah. you know, so it's hard to do exhibits, hard to get people, hard to do engage. What, what do you see as your challenges? I think, you know, one of the bigger things here in Arizona, and this is um, pretty rampant for all of us, all of our institutions, is that, you know, you're not in a state that municipally funds museums. Um, cities do, you know, the city of Phoenix funds, a, you know, a small, small portion of Phoenix Art Museum. Obviously, Scottsdale has a pretty extensive, both Spirit of the West and Smoka, are both funded, you know, in some municipal format. You know, the challenge, of course, of Tucson is that we're not municipal funded museums. So there's always going to be a little bit of a funding gap. You know, we're fortunate, of course, because we have great donors that are keeping us going. And, you know, the museum itself has had to, of course, because of COVID, not necessarily retract. It just can't be as ambitious as, as it's sort of the, the path that it was on. So we are kind of refining and um, sort of, you know, refreshing our, our path forward. Uh, you know, I think finance is going to be a challenge, you know, down the line. And I don't, you know, it, the museum will sustain itself. It's just, you know, I think it's going to be those resources that are going to be really important. You know, the other thing too is, again, was we're, we're constantly need to evolve and, um, you know, we need to be nimble, which is really hard for museums to do, right? You have to not only at this point respond to the challenges, whether it's the pandemic, the financial challenges, or, or else, of course, a lot of this sort of, you know, civic unrest and, and social inequities, you know, it's how do you really respond to that's going to sort of define whether or not you survive in the future. I don't think, honestly, it's going to be a third of museums. I think more will survive. More people will come out to support them. However, I think the output and how museums operate will change dramatically. And, um, you know, we're planning for that, which is, again, makes us in a, puts us in a better position than those sort of big institutions where, you know, you're thinking about years of decades of, democ or of bureau, you know, bureaucratic systems, right? I mean, LACMA, you know, you're seeing SFMOMA, you know, you're seeing all the big ones being called out now by all of these sort of challenges. And the great thing about TMA is that we really can pivot where we are somewhat nimble. And so we really can, can do that and really respond and reshape the future. So it's just going to be, you know, I think those are some of the big challenges, the hurdles. Um, you know, you're fighting for an audience. I think we're seeing that now and, and you know, we're responding to it as much as we can. Uh, but, you know, of course, the pandemic creates a lot of, a lot of challenges with audience development. Yeah, it does. Well, and a lot of museums now are, I guess they've given them the ability to de-access things that they normally couldn't through the museum. Yeah. Like, you know, there's a Pollock that's, is, I don't know, I think it's just sold and there's Frankenthaler that's coming up and yep. Christie's and Sotheby's are all like, yeah, you know, <laughs> but I mean, that's a, that's, you know, that's a new thing. I mean, is TMA involved in doing anything like that as far as de-accessing? Are you guys not going to have to do that, hopefully? No, not at, not at this time. I think, you know, that's a, that's a conversation. We're obviously having a lot of internal discussions, both at the board collections committee and of course the staff level as well. We are not at this point engaged in any of that. It's too early from my standpoint to say how that's going to have an effect on the larger landscape of museums. And you know, TMA is in a very different position than when you say you're the Brooklyn Museum or you're the Baltimore Museum. You know, you're talking about extremely deep collections, high, high value. 
you know, you're looking what they're putting on the, on the auction block and they're millions of dollars. Yeah. Um, we're nowhere near that necessarily in our collection, you know, capabilities, um, nor would we want to because, you know, those high value pieces are out on view for all to enjoy. Right. You know, they're not pieces that are sitting in, you know, the vaults for, you know, or they've never been seen or anything like that. And, you know, for us too, we still firmly believe that, yes, we are, a, you know, private 501c3, the collection is still owned by the public. We don't own the collection. It's not an asset, we say. It's an asset to the community. And so, you know, we're very, very aware of our donors and we're very grateful to our donors. And, and it's our collection is built by donors, really. I mean, many things come from gifts. We've had, you know, obviously some great support groups that raise funds to, you know, build some pivotal pieces in there. But overall, I mean, I, I, we want to make sure that we're being responsible in our collection management and we're honoring, you know, those gifts to the institution. So it's really, it's a really tough conversation. And I know every museum is looking at it differently and there's no, there's no right or wrong answer here. That's, you know, that works across the board. It's just, it really comes down to individual institutions and how they see themselves and really how they're weathering this pandemic. Um, you know, for us, we made some really swift moves in the beginning in early March, uh, of course, when we closed down on March 17th. And uh, that's really sustained us in addition to, you know, the generosity of our board and donors to really keep the museum going during these really challenging times. And we're seeing the public come out. I mean, we've, we've seen growing numbers of individuals coming to the museum, making reservations for our time tickets and supporting the institution other ways, you know, buying merchandise in the gift shop or in the museum store or even eating lunch at the cafe. So, you know, even, even now, as we're seeing a rise, of course, in, you know, cases, people still feel that the museum is safe and we hope that they do so because we are taking all the correct measures to make sure that the public is safe and will enjoy their experience. And if the people want to visit the museum, but maybe not uh, in an in a actual going in, virtually they can go to uh, Tucson Museum of Art dot com or dot is it dot org or dot com? It's dot org. Yep, Tucson Museum of Art dot org, and you can see a lot there. And also, too, our YouTube page is quite extensive. I know a lot of these, you know, great the great work that the curators are doing with these conversations. Uh, I know Christine has had a great series with Cookies with the Curator, which has just been really fun to listen to um, and to really engage with artists such as Karen Kitchell and Marlo Catoni and Sean Huckins. Um, and also to the, the panels that uh, Dr. Julie Saucy is producing, they're all available online. And, you know, as of right now, you know, pretty much 95% of what we're producing is free um, to the public. And so we're really fortunate to, again, have the support of many great people who are supporting the funding for this work to, to produce. Any last words you want to, tell the audience about maybe, you know, one of the things I'd like you to actually just maybe uh, talk about a little bit, if somebody was interested in becoming a museum director, right? How do, how do they go about that path for somebody who's out there listening to this? Maybe who's an artist or in art school and going, eh, I don't know, maybe I, maybe I want a different path. What would your suggestion be? It's a tough one. Um, you know, I think overall explore and don't be afraid of experiences outside of those sort of large metropolitan areas. Like I said, I don't have necessarily the same maybe upbringing or, or uh, you know, sort of career path that many of the big, the big directors and the big institutions have. However, every single place that I've been has been a really great learning experience. And, you know, not being afraid of, of those communities that, you know, as in Kansas City, most people call the fly, flyover country. Um, you know, or even out here, you know, in Tucson, um, which is an amazing community to be part of, uh, you know, they're really great communities that have, that have done great work. And I think the future of museums are going to come out of these regional institutions. And I think that's something that's really important that, that a young director or a young person coming in really understand because you can make change and impact here happen in a very swift, in a very swift timeline. And you can really be influential and important and do some impactful work that will then, you know, have a greater impact on the larger sort of canon of what museums are doing. And I can say too, you know, just to kind of, you know, give pride to our institution and the work that TMA is doing, you know, through this IMLS grant, we've been contacted by many institutions in many metropolitan areas to talk to us about what we're doing and how we're implementing this particular project 
And it's really, I think it's really a feather in the cap of the work of the, of the staff to really see that because, you know, when you're talking to the Museum of Art and Design in New York and they're, they're asking for certain attributes of really, you know, how you're going about this, that's really great to, you know, that, that's, that's a really great sense of pride because that goes to show the work you're doing is important, it's impactful, and it's getting noticed by a lot of these other sort of, you know, large institutions that may not have the resources or the abilities to do so at this time. So I think those are all really great things. And, you know, it's, it's we, everybody loves, I mean, who doesn't love a great regional institution? I mean, you think about, you know, where you just were in Santa Fe and Taos and, I mean, they're just, they're amazing institutions and you're, it's always, it's always so much fun to go to them and see what's on view and really what their take is, right? I mean, it's, it's always something different. Well, and you can do like a Jim Ballinger did with Phoenix mm -hmm. Art Museum and start off as a small regional uh, museum and then turn it into a blockbuster if you can stay long enough. I mean, he was there for yep. 40 years, <laughs> you know? And Jim's Jim, one of the greats. Jim yeah. is one of the greats. I mean, he is... He is one of the, um, you know, it's it's somebody so great to look up to and to see that level of career and investment in one institution is just, you know, it's unheard of. So I think, you know, he's done a phenomenal job and to see where that institution is, it wouldn't be there without Jim. Yeah, that's true. And we're hoping you are our Jim Ballinger. <laughs> we want you to stay for 40 We're working years. on it. We're working on it. I don't know if I have the real estate that he's got, but, uh, but hopefully maybe we'll go up. I don't know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's you know, down the line. It's just going to continue to grow. I think Tucson is going to continue to grow. The downtown is blowing up. I mean, it just looks so unchanged. I mean, it just, you can't even recognize it from five years ago. And, you know, five years ago or 10 years ago, for sure, 10 years ago, we were looking at how can we bring the museum maybe to the foothills. And the reality is, no, the foothills definitely needs to go to the museum because mm -hmm. that area is, you know, one, that's where the culture is. That's where the people are. And two, yeah. it's growing and it's going to be tremendously uh, different in another five or 10 years. Yeah, absolutely. And there's good there. I mean, there's so much energy happening in that in that small sector of the town. And um, it's only, you know, getting stronger. And to see the young professionals that are staying in Tucson uh, to build the city is really promising. Um, and, you know, to see the work and investment that's being made. It really truly is going to be, you know, you know, life changing here in the next, you know, sort of five to 10 years. And, you know, for us as an institution, we're not just looking at now. I mean, there's a lot of challenges we're all facing immediately, but you got to look forward. You have to look to the future and, and think, you know, I, you know, I tell the staff this all the time and the board, it's that we're making decisions that are not for us, right? We're making decisions for the next generation of folks to come in, the impact that we're going to make, the things we collect you know, yeah, we get to enjoy them. We get to sort of, you know, pat ourselves on the back that we've done this. However, this is for the future. This is not for us. This is, you know, down the line. And I think, you know, it's hard to say it's, you know, because it's, it's hard to think of the future in those terms. And um, I think that's really important for any institution when they make these decisions, um, specifically for us, you know, the investment of Latin American art, the investment in regionalism and the sense of place, and of course, the communities that exist here. Well, Jeremy, we're thrilled you're our museum director. <laughs> it's an honor to be here. It's, it's, and it's great to chat with you. It's, it's been too long. No, it has been. It, I don't even know when. I can't remember when we talked last. I think it was February, might have been. Something. <laughs> it just, this, 2020 just went away. I mean, it's just like God. It did. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, so. I, and But thank it, you for this opportunity. It's great. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's always great to talk to art always great to talk museums and um, like I said I feel honored and fortunate to be in the position that I'm in and have the ability to to connect with audiences in this way. Wonderful well people need to go see the new Hasser uh, wing they need to visit the, the the website which is Tucson Museum of Art org and join the Instagram as well because we want our our uh, local museum to grow it's really a phen phenomenal museum I believe in that museum and uh, I, I, I believe in you. So thank you for coming on the air. Thank Art you so Museum much. Diaries, and we'll talk very soon, actually. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank right. you so much. Thanks, Jeremy. Bye-bye. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.